<laughs> cool. Hey everybody, thank you so much for coming today. Um, my name is Karen Reese. I'm the president of Urban Community Arts Network and um, we're putting this thing on. This is the fourth Level Up conference that we've done. Um, we skipped last year, but we hope to get back to having this be an annual thing. Um, couple bits of housekeeping in your folders. There's a couple of things. You have your agenda for the day. You have bios of all the speakers who are gonna to present today. And then some note paper. Um, if you need a pen, we have pens on the sign-in table in there. If you have not signed in at some point before you leave, if you wouldn't mind just checking your name off the list so we know who's all here. Um, on the other side, oh, also behind that, there's an evaluation form. Um, you can either fill that evaluation form out on paper and leave it face down on the sign-in table or there's a QR code on it, so you can scan the QR code and do it online, whichever way you want. But please, please fill out that evaluation form. That does two things. Number one, helps us get money to support this sort of thing. But more importantly, number two, it helps us make sure that these kinds of things are actually useful for you guys. And so any ideas you have, you know, be brutally honest, tell us what you think, what you'd like to see in the future. So if you just do that at some point before you leave today, we really appreciate that. On the other side of your folder, um, we have a couple of things. The half sheet is a survey that we're doing as in collaboration with the UW. So we're trying to collect all kinds of different voices from the hip hop scene in Madison so that we know what people are thinking, where people want to see the scene go. This is also to support the task force on equity and, mu equity and music and entertainment um, that has been going on over this past year. So that's a city task force that involves some people from around, some community members from around town, as well as people on city committees for the sole purpose of figuring out how do we get hip hop and other underrepresented music genres on stages more often in Madison and on a consistent basis. So that report was just submitted. It goes to the Common Council on Tuesday and then it'll probably get referred out to all the different committees and then it'll be final. We can talk about actual money an implementation by June, um, but we want you guys to know what's going on. We want to hear what you guys think about those recommendations, and we want everyone as much as possible to be involved to push to make this stuff actually happen. So all those recommendations are in your folders. We'll talk about that later today at 5.30, because we're going to just have a conversation about Madison Hip Hop. So check that out at some point. Food in the back, help yourself. There's also a poster board in the back um, and some Sharpies back there. I would love it if throughout the day, if you want to go at least sign your name, draw something, you know, whatever, just put, leave yourself so we see, you know, who's in the room and all the creativity that's in the room and, you know, graffiti part of hip hop and, and element. So make sure you got that represented. Bathrooms are out the back door and to your right. Um, there's an elevator. If you don't want to go up and down the stairs, there's an elevator back there. If you'd re rather do that, I think that's everything. All right, so first session, uh, I want to introduce to you Roy Elkins, who's the founder and president of broadjam.com. If you don't know, you should, and I'm sure you're going to hear more about that. Um, Roy has been a big supporter of UCAN in particular, and making sure that the hip hop community is represented. He also is the founder of the Between the Waves Music Industry Conference that ran for its second year this summer. So I'm sure he'll also say a little bit more about that, but this, you cannot beat um, paying five dollars or nothing to see this kind of information. So, thank you, Roy. Thank you, Karen. How about it for Karen? Um, <laughs> you, you know, it, it's it's truly. Uh, I, I, I'm always impressed at what one person can make happen in a community, and along with Payne and Cha and Corey and Rob Dees and, and Boss Lady and all all of the different people in this town that are trying to help hip hop uh, have a place to play. And that starts with just a couple people. And now there's a task force in the city. Uh, there's uh, places are opening up. It is really remarkable. So you, know, you, can, you can make stuff happen. And we were just talking a minute ago, it is starting to happen. It's not happening as fast as we'd all like it, but there is progress happening. So I really appreciate what you can is doing. Um, so I wanna talk a little today about I'll give you a little of my background, a little about Broad Jam, just a little, and then we're going to talk mostly about you and your business of music, and then a little about you specifically. What, you know, we all know what we want to do. We want to make music for a living. That's what this whole concept is about. So that's what I'm going to spend my next uh, 
few minutes on. So, uh, as Karen said, uh, I, I recently founded a conference called Between the Waves, and it's our mission simply to help uh, help songwriters and producers and composers make music and learn how to make a living making music. That's in June of this year. I'll talk a little more about that. So, uh, let's get into it, though. Uh, rather than stand up here and tell you, you know, I did this and I did that and all that stuff, I'm going to put my impressive resume up here on the board, okay? And, and I'm sure you will be extremely impressed when you read this. I'm not a boat captain yet, and I'm, but I am lucky and thankful, okay? So, uh, pretty impressive, huh? Especially the first half of that list there, that's just, uh, uh, how many thought that was impressive? Anybody think that was impressive? Okay, there you go. See, all you have to, all you have to do is laugh at my jokes, and then you get a t-shirt. It's pretty easy, all right? Okay. Uh, but I am not unlike many musicians in this world. I did everything I could to try to uh, make it in the music business. And, and every job I could, I tried to play in every band I could, uh, but I didn't know I had a technology skill. That's how I ended up getting, making a living. And I, got, I went to work in a music store in Memphis, Tennessee. I moved to Memphis to play jazz and blues. I grew up in Michigan, uh, and I went down to play on Beale Street. And I ended up uh, working in a music store down there. And uh, I didn't know I had a skill with synthesizers and sampling keyboards. I just was always into it. And my customers were coming in and asking questions. And next thing you know, a Sonic company, a corporation in Philly hired me just as they were getting going to run their training program to teach people about sampling keyboards. I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. I had no idea. But my blinders were so on that I'm going to make it in the music business. And I learned just open up and whatever comes my way, try to jump on it and run with it a little while. And I never had any idea that years later I'd be heading up uh, uh, one of the largest music sites in the world for independent musicians because I had a technology skill. So that's how my career evolved. Very lucky and thankful for that. So yeah, now since my resume was so impressive, I'm going to impress you a little more with my educational background. Three older brothers. Anybody have older brothers? So you know what I mean about education, right? There's no, no better education than an older brother, especially when you disagree with them and they're a lot bigger than you. Um, and then I spent three years in college, and unfortunately, it was my freshman year all three times. Um, so, and then I married up. But that, that's the, the number one thing we can do as men is marry up. In fact, most men will marry up. Uh, again, that's a joke. Uh, anybody think that's the only way to go? Okay, see, it's really easy. Just laugh when I tell a joke. I only got one more shirt, so I only got one more laugh, I guess. But my wife is a, a DJ uh, here in Madison on Wisconsin Public Radio. She used to have a folk show on Sunday nights, and now for the morning show, she runs a classical show for Wisconsin Public Radio and has a whole bunch of listeners every morning. So we're both, we both love our industry, love our job, love what we do for a living. But I really got an education when I started my own company. And that's what I'd like to talk to you a little more about today. So I'll tell you what, what I do with Rajan. Uh, we have about 190,000 members now. I need to update the slide from 190 countries. Um, and we've had about 700,000 songs uploaded to us. I started the company in uh, no, uh, September of 1999. We're coming up on our 20-year anniversary next year. Um, and where most people know us for music licensing, for getting music into film and TV and radio and, and advertising and uh, uh, internet shows, whatever, but just trying to license your music. But we believe we have the largest social network there is for independent musicians. 
we have about 150,000 people come to the site every month just to trade files and, and meet musicians from around the world. And uh, these are some of the other things you can do on the site because we know most people will not get licensed. That's why we have a social network. So you can come and collaborate with people from all over the world. And that's one of the things that the, the most rewarding thing I think I've ever done in my career is build a system that allows musicians just to meet. And every day somebody will say to us, uh, you know, I'm from Maine and I'm writing an album with a person from Australia that I met on your site. And I just love that. I love the fact that we're helping people connect. And 96% of our members never pay us a dime. So that's, the, that's the, the, the social part of this. So that's what we do. And I would encourage you, if you haven't, explore the site. And don't worry, get on the site and explore it and connect with other musicians from all over. And, and find somebody you really admire and connect with them, see if you can work with them and collaborate with them. That's the magic of Raw Jam. Music license is a way to make a little extra money, and uh, there is a cost to that, but you can take advantage of the site without spending a dime. Okay? And this is some of the, our partners on the music licensing side, some of the places we placed music. Um, uh, boy, it's just this, uh, you know, there probably isn't a show at this point where we haven't had a song yet, but this, this show here, uh, Bad Girls Club, I'm sure you've seen that on one of the networks. We used to have a song or two every single episode for years and years and years. We used to get a song in that show. And, and um, just lots of lots of different stuff. And I want to talk a little about just a couple. Of, this is one email I just got two days ago from a guy who just signed up in September. Got a gig with NASCAR right out of the gate, which is very rare. That doesn't happen often. Generally, you got to be on the site six months or a year before you start getting any traction with this person. And they hooked up with John DeLange from Timber, Tinderbox, and John runs the Discovery Network. Um, uh, he's the music supervisor for them, or one of the guys that run it. So really, I'm always appreciative when people let us know that they're having success, because we only connect the buyer and seller to music. Sometimes we don't even know if they ever make a deal. We just connect the buyer and seller, they make a deal, and they just don't tell us. And I appreciate it when people send us a note and say they did. So let's talk about how licensing works. And, and specifically with Brodgen, but this is not different than any other publishing company or site like ours. A few years ago, there was this uh, movie called Dinner for Schmucks. Did anybody ever, ever see that with Steve Corral? It's a really funny movie. If, you, if you've never seen it, check it out. It's just it's really cool. And they called us and they asked us if we, they were looking for a flamenco guitar with a Portuguese singer singing over the top of it. And I believe this was on a Thursday or Friday night. And they said to us, uh, uh, and I, or I said, one of our guys said, when do you need this? Well, we need it by Sunday. And I said, this Sunday, you need a flamenco guitar with a Portuguese singer by this Sunday. Well, they probably had a deal for another uh, uh, song and they just couldn't get the deal signed. So they came to us. And I learned about the power of the internet with this particular opportunity. I posted it on our site. Within 24 hours, we had 20 submissions. But there was one key there. I said to them, I said, how much are you paying? And they said, $20,000. Man, I started speaking Portuguese right at that minute. <laughs> and I, so I learned how to play from Minko that night. you know. But we posted it on our site. And man, you wouldn't believe the quality of the music we got in 24 hours. And they ended up making a deal for $23,000 with the guy. Um, Another one is House Autry. They came to us and they were looking for, House Autry is like a breading company, like a shake and bake. And they're looking for songs for their jingles, or the jingles for their radio shows. And so we put it on our site and basically commercials. That's what they're looking for, beds for commercials. And within a few weeks, we had 40 custom jingles written for them. And for nothing. People just writing jingles, they, you know, and then they're going to pay a certain amount of money. And they were going to pay $10,000 for one of those jingles. And then they came and they, they started doing some testing. <clears throat> they were testing different audiences. Well, what they found is the black market liked this song and the white market liked this song. And they came back to us and they said, well, what, what can we do? And I said, well, how about paying each one of them $10,000? And they said, yes, okay, we'll do that. And so they ended up contracting 
these two completely different songs. Now, what they were looking for was really interesting, because they were looking for um, like a Robert Johnson guy sitting on a front porch playing a guitar, singing about the smell of fish and chicken in the air. And I know that smell, because my mom made, made the best chicken in the world, the best fried chicken in the world. I knew exactly what they wanted. The songs we got, one song sounded like the theme for Rembrandt's that they picked, and the other one sounded like the Brooklyn Gospel Choir. They, they found two songs that they thought would fit their markets, and it was much better than what they ever anticipated. So, so sometimes we can actually help our providers of these leads come up with something better than what they were looking for. So that paid, they ended up giving the songwriters a couple thousand more each to go back and tweak the lyrics a little and change it around. They had $12,000 for a 30 second jingle. And so now I wish every single placement we had was like one of these two. It's just not the, um, should I stand on the other side or? No, you don't. You're good, I'm you're probably good. going to be over here, so. No, <laughs> sorry. You're good. sorry, my apologies. Uh, then the last one, um, this is one of my favorite ones. We had, uh, this is from the Bones TV show years and years ago, probably 10 years ago now. And they were looking for a death metal song, and they were kind of describing it like, find the, the, the loudest guitar you can find, put it in the smallest closet, and turn it up to 11, and hire a chainsaw to sing lead. It's kind of what they were looking for. And we found it. And that song uh, generated immediately about ten, about 5,000 up front, and then maybe 10 or 20,000 over the next 10 years in public performance fees. So sometimes you get money up front. And the network shows, like the main networks, NBC, Fox, uh, CBS, the main networks, you will get some money up front. And then every time that replays anywhere in the world, you get a royalty on this if you're the songwriter. So if this show repeats, those guys who wrote the song in 2008 are getting a check. My guess that's probably about $1,000 a year at this point. And because this show repeats all over the world, this plays all over the world. So you get five or six of those, seven of those, 10 of those, 15 of those, and it could be some nice revenue for a long period of time. Now on the cable shows, you don't get anything up front, but you enjoy the revenue streams on the back end. So this is not, the, music, the licensing market is not something to ignore. But also, I don't want you to jump into it and think, yeah, I got perfect songs for music, or for film and TV, and I'm gonna talk about that in just a second here. So here's what you need to prepare. This is where you should take some notes. If you're, gonna, if you're going to pitch, these are, whether to, to, to film and TV or whoever you're pitching to, you should understand there's just a few basic things that you should get together. One, have a good business card. Just a good business card so somebody can remember you. Uh, a lot of people don't use them anymore, but it's still nice to, you know, you get home, and you, you, you have a reminder of this person in your pocket when you're, when you're up in your pockets on your desk. Make sure all your data is complete and accurate. We all have profiles online, correct? Or some kind. Somebody comes to your profile after you've sent them music, they want to learn about you. And if your profile is blank and empty, uh, they're, they're going on to the next person because they got 100 songs there that they're checking into. So make sure your promo materials are perfect. Absolutely perfect. Uh, relevant photos. We know what classical music looks like. We know what country music looks like. We know what rap music looks like. And make sure when somebody looks at your photo or your album cover, they have an idea of what's on the inside. I mean, you, you wouldn't, when you walk into a car dealership, you're not gonna walk into a car dealership and look at the car that's all dented and beat up and, and, and the guy says, that's got a great engine and it runs 100 miles an hour. You're not even gonna get to that point. Uh, the number of people that attach their children to their promo kits or they'll put a pet in there or their high school graduation picture. This is your business. I can't imagine going out to the world and, and putting something else that is totally unrelated to my business to sell my business. So this is what I hope you get out of this today is this is your business. Wait, you look at, we got a lot of creativity in this room. There's a lot of us, who very, all of us are very creative. We gotta get on that other side, that cognitive side too, and start working there. Make sure your contact info is on every item. I got a stack of these CDs that is constantly on my desk. I'm trying to find out who the hell did this, because it's great music, 
and there's nothing on it. I have no idea who owns it or who, who it belongs to. Um, some of this stuff you probably already know, but Facebook and LinkedIn profiles. Facebook for fans and connections, LinkedIn for the business. Anybody in the music industry is on LinkedIn. You can join all kinds of industry groups on LinkedIn, like music supervisor groups, uh, genre-related groups, managers, agents. You can join these groups and start meeting people in the business. You know, it, we all know this business isn't about does the talent make it to the top. Certainly, there's some great talent at the top, but there's other people who are less talented that have really understood the business and made it. So you start putting those two things together, you, get, you increase your odds. A website that reflects who you are as an artist. Let's not go to your website and see something totally different than what you are. Make sure every, this is your business again. Remove all negative posts from you or your friends. So anybody have any crazy friends? A few? Yeah, I have, I have two. They're not on my, you won't find them on my Facebook page uh, because they're blocked. Because I have to run a business. And I don't want to endorse anybody one way or the other, whether they're crazy or not crazy. So what happens is the first thing, somebody gets a piece of music they really like, the first thing they do is they go to their Facebook page and check them out. They see a whole list of hate and anger and crap and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do next. So the, again, your image is your business. So just keep that in mind. Now, there may be a reason to do that because you have a certain market you're going after. That there may be a rate, but make sure you just take that in consideration. Know the answer to this. Who do you sound like? I know this is a hard one because we're all unique. We all have our own different. But remember, what we're trying to do is make it easy for somebody on the back end to buy our music. That's what we want. I want it, I want it to be really easy for somebody to do business with me. So if I say, you know, uh, you know, my grooves, uh, they're a little like Eminem, and my lyrics are a little like Bob Dylan, but I sing like Bruno Mars. All right, the person on the other end knows exactly what I'm about. And then they look at this 59-year-old guy and say, he's lying. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I'm talking about. You, you need to give them a little, if they say, well, most of them say, well, I'm unique. There's never been anybody sound like me. That person on the other end doesn't know what to do then. You've just created more work for them. Who do people say you, you remind them of? That's what should be in your bio. You know, say, so, you know, I got a little of this flavor, a lot of that, and my groove sound like blah, 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 whatever it is. That's what your bio should be about. So the person that's licensing or buying or going to sign you, right out of the gate, they understand what they're getting. Know what a deal is likely to entail. What does that mean? What if you were offered a record contract today? Would you know if you're getting a good deal? Most of us probably wouldn't. So yeah, there's a great book called Music, Money, and Success. I think it's the best book ever in the industry. It's about licensing, it's about music. It's a $15 book, it's about every contract. And I, I look at this book all the time. I've been reading it for 20 plus years and they're on their 10th or 11th edition now. I don't even know where they are. But uh, one is twin brothers that wrote the book. One's from the recording business, the other one's from the publishing business. Every contract you can imagine. So when that record company or that licensing company offers you a deal, you know if it's good or bad. There's, there's nothing worse than being emotionally tied to your music and just want to get a deal and get moving and then somebody take you to the cleaners. Know what a good deal is before that crosses your path. You know, look, if, if, if McDonald's calls offered you a job, we know what McDonald's is going to pay, right? Probably 10 to 12 bucks an hour, if that much. Or if you're going to get a job as an auto mechanic, 35 to 50,000 a year probably, right? Something like that. Why is it we don't know a good deal about something we want to do for a living? This is what we all want to do. So I encourage you, get, understand this. So when, because then if you pursue it and you do some of the things we're talking about today, you will get offered some type of contract at some point. And so you can just start negotiating. You don't have to research at that point. 
Now, I always recommend you get somebody who's in contractual law to look at it, but the point is, is you should be able to look through it and say, oh, I don't want an exclusive deal. I just want non-exclusive. I don't want it in perpetuity. I just want it for two years. Just some of the basic terms. I don't want it global. I just want to give them my rights in uh, the Midwest. So those are all things uh, just to learn out of the game, okay? And know who you are pitching in their history. Uh, this happens so much that somebody has made it in the music business, and you get an opportunity to go to them and say, I'm going to lay my music on them. Well, they're not even in the part of the business that you're in. Uh, you know, we're, we're uh, so, so, so you look them up and say, okay, this guy's really looking for music for the next Garth Brooks album. All right, do you have any music that sounds like Garth Brooks? Well, you do, then you pitch it. If you don't, then you don't pitch it. You don't want to waste anybody's time. And, and so that happens quite often. Uh, so just make sure you can find out about anybody on the internet, all the good and all the bad about them. Find out what, what their history has been and don't waste their time. And material, all your materials should reflect who you are as an artist. This, and this is all you think about is making it. Because the next person, this is all they think about. I'm assuming most people in here, how many in here want, would like to make it as an artist? It's about everybody here, right? So from this point on, it isn't just about the music. We got, in, and I'm sure some of you have already gone and have thought about this. So this point on, it's about the business of music and your creativity. Now, as you get further down the path, you want to get somebody else to handle the business side of it for you, so you can focus. But right now, we need to, you know, be a little more well-rounded. Now, let's have a little fun here. This is what not to say, and these are the things that have actually been pitched to us or friends of ours that have told these stories. And by the way, all the stories I tell, they get a little better every time I tell them. They improve like a good wine with age. So uh, at some point, they will probably completely lie, complete lies. You know, Maybe I could be president someday, right? <laughs> Again, that's a joke. Uh, did you just laugh? There you go. There you go. That's the last t-shirt, man. You laugh at a joke, you get a t-shirt. There's cookies back there for the next round, OK? So all right. So uh, the drummer was high in the pain in the ass during the session. This is an excuse. So often we're, we're, we're way too critical of our own stuff. There isn't a song that I have ever produced in my life or wrote in my life that I don't listen to and say, damn, I wish I would have just edited that a little more. I wish I'd have changed that. Maybe I shouldn't have, that reverb is just a little too long. You know what I'm talking about. You always, well, when, we're, when, when it, the mix is done, we're, we're going into cell, cell mode now. We're going to talk about the good things about this music, not any of the things we wish we would have done different. I've played with that drummer, by the way, a lot. This isn't the final version. Again, that's more humor, but I don't have t-shirts, so I assume you're not going to laugh anymore. Is that correct? All right. Uh, this isn't the final version. I'd like to do the, redo the vocals. Again, another excuse. My friends and family love it. That's nice. My, I've written over 500 songs. My mom loves every one of them. She's never bought one of them today because I give them to her. So the point is, this is this is all irrelevant stuff, but it's something that we go through at some, you know, everybody I'm around likes it. You know, they don't count. They don't count unless, unless they're also telling you, I don't like this. I'm lucky I'm married to somebody that tells me, nah, you're on the wrong track. She's in the music business. She knows her, her stuff. And she just tells me, I'm very lucky with that. Can you just forward this to all your contacts? Yes and no. Yes, I can, but no. You, you, we, you find, yes, I can, but not going to do that. Uh, but if we like it, so yeah, we're going we're gonna to push it on to a couple people. If, you know, we're not going to send it to everybody because that would be a waste of everybody's time. But we will push on a couple people if we like it. I'm not very excited about this project. At that point, when you're pitching, you should be really excited about it. All right? The Beatles, Kanye, and Garth Brooks suck. Sometimes we try to pull other people down. And, and maybe some of these people do suck. I don't know. Never met any of them. But I would love to have one royalty check from any one of them for one quarter. <laughs> and it isn't just about the money, you know, but certainly we have opinions of all their music. You know? uh, but they, they've made it. They've understood the business, and they're doing something right to, to, to uh, uh, be successful. If you hand somebody a CD, 
uh, and you know you're going to meet with them ahead of time, is listen to tracks one, two, and three. Don't make their life more difficult. By, you know, it, or if you're sending them a link, don't send them a link to a whole list of songs. Never get listened to. Send them a link to one, two, or three songs. Your three best songs. That's what you want. I will listen to two or three songs, but so often I get a link and it'll say, can you listen to my playlist? There's 800 songs on the playlist. I couldn't listen to this in my lifetime. Give me your two or three best. And then that helps, even if it's just one, that helps formulate an opinion. Okay? My music is perfect for film and TV. I'm going to come back to this one in just a second. Because we all know we got songs for film and TV, right? Everybody, right? We know we have perfect songs for film and TV. We'll get back. We're on a limited budget. Everybody on planet Earth is on a limited budget. There is no record company that says, hey, Foo Fighters, go ahead and just spend $100 million making that record. We don't care. Every single project is on a limited budget. And some of the best projects in the world had no money to start off. So the equipment and the budget does not make the art. The heart does. So I've been playing since I was two. Eight year old. It's about the music and the product. Okay? Um, and I, you know, some of these, and you're looking at, God, I can't believe people say that. Well, sometimes we might lean a little that way. You know, I've got a lot of experience. You know, I'm really experienced in this. Well, the captain of the Titanic sailed for 26 years, the same route every single day. He had a lot of experience, too. Experience really means nothing to somebody who's buying your product. Is it good or bad? I heard you did this for my friend's band. Can you do it? Yeah, if you're good, yeah. We, you know, there are people in the industry that can help out. My entire catalog is great, and I can write in every genre. There's been nobody in this, and we hear this a lot, I can write anything. And there's nobody in the history of the music business who's ever wrote successfully, to my knowledge, more than three genres. Uh, it's, it's a stretch to see somebody writing successfully in country music and classical in rap and, you know, well, maybe jazz, uh, but rap and classical, or jazz and country. It's very, it's a, it's a real stretch. So re resist uh, those exaggerations. It may be true, maybe you can, but nobody's ever done it, so it's not believable. This one's not believable. I wrote the lyrics and the music, arranged everything, I booked the band, I sweeped the floors, and I turned off the lights. There, well, a lot of us do this. Uh, but you don't want to use it as, sales pitch, as a sales pitch because records aren't made like that. In great productions, it, it isn't just one person. Usually there's a really good engineer and a really good management company and a really good agent and good artists on it. It's very rare that one person comes along and can do all of that. So just resist this. And then if you don't get signed, don't threaten to kill them when they don't sign you. That doesn't help you get a second uh, 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 gig with him or a second face-to-face -face meeting. I had a friend of mine tell me a story about uh, a person and when he initially said no, he said, let's, let's revisit this in six months and, and uh, it got pretty crazy. So, a little fun here. But again, I, although I say it's a little fun, it's still, let's just be, you know, uh, aware when you're pitching your music, it's positive. This is you in your future. There's no excuses. When you have that ready to go and ready to move forward, there's no reason you, you don't talk great about it, all right? Okay, so this is what I want to get back to. We all have music, we have music good for film and TV, right? Take a second for me right now and write down the top 10 TV shows. I'm probably saying, oh, he's got me on that one. I, I might be able to get one. I might be able to get uh, CSI or Empire or Blue wow. Bloods or... Okay, this is your market. This is part of business. So my challenge to you, your first challenge here, you need to go to the Nielsen TV ratings and look, what are the top 10 shows? Here's what they were two years ago, or last year I think it was, 2017. At this, this point, in the first week of November. This is what they were the first week in November of this year. <clears throat> Anybody have football on their list? Probably not. Well, what I would be doing right now, if this was going to be my market, I'd be listening to the, what's going into the commercial, what's coming out of the commercial, what's the background music for football. 
because clearly that's what's, uh, what people are licensing in the top 10 shows. Now, when you get to the start, you get down a little further, you get to, you start seeing the dead guy shows, the CSIs, the, the, the Bones, and all those shows where there's some dead guy that they're cutting open. And the, there's a lot of like hip hop grooves being used with small rock over the top of it. But listen to the music and make sure you're not wasting your time. You know, if you're writing death metal that has fuck every other word in it, hmm. you're going to have very little opportunity to get your music licensed and to film and TV. Now, you might make it on and make Breaking Bad or some show like that that's a real, uh, you know, uh, uh, edgy show, but you're not going to make it. And most of the, most shows are not going to allow language. So don't waste your time. I'm not saying, I'm not endorsing, you know, if you're into heavy metal and you're writing, uh, explicit language, that's your thing. That's okay. I don't judge, I don't care. But just make sure you don't waste your time or somebody else's time. So, but you can, you can look at this every single day and find out what is hot. You can also look at advertisers and what kind of music are they licensing. So it, this saves you a lot of time and energy when you do this, okay? So this is a quote that I've had framed on my desk for probably 30 years now. This is from Johnny Cash's daughter. I couldn't name one of her songs. I can name a few of her dad's songs. Know a little about him. But this is what we struggle with. It's one of my favorite quotes ever. It's, it basically says, we're a creative mind that isn't valued by society, uh, basically until we make it, then we're a genius. Uh, but we treat the creative people in our society like shameful alien cousins. I'm going to name my next punk band that shameful alien cousins. It was great, but I, I just love this because we, our world relies so uh, much on cognitive and logic, logical processes. You know, what, what's the first thing cut in schools when they cut budgets in schools? Music, the arts, music. We don't care about the creative process. So, so basically, we, we as creative people have to work a lot harder to get noticed, and that's the difference. The people who understand that, the business side of it is cognitive and logical, and the creative side of it. And if you can somehow balance that, you have a much better opportunity. I, I just love this quote. It reminds me every day. Because I struggle. I, I've been running my own business for uh, 20 years. I was VP of Sales and Marketing at Sonic Foundry. I was an executive at the prior company. And I still struggle with the business aspects of it every day. Because I just want to create and build stuff within the business. I struggle to this day. But I have to remind myself. Yeah, I have to do those things, and I have to know how much we spend and make, and, and so on. So, so that's a little about um, what Broadjam does, the film and TV market, how you should get into it. Um, what I'd like to talk about, how do you make yourself more valuable as a musician? All right, so let me just ask you a few questions. Anybody here rap? Okay, great. Anybody here sing? Okay, anybody here rap and sing? Okay, so are you more valuable if you can rap and sing than if you can do one or the other? You're better if you can do both, right? So if I'm a rapper, I'm going to learn how to sing. If I'm a singer, I'm going to learn how to rap. Especially if you look at the top ten right now. <laughs> I mean, hip-hop dominates the music industry right now. So... Can you sing harmony? All right, so now you're a little more valuable, correct? And I'm just putting this out in a logical order. These are things, if you, if you play an instrument, anybody? Okay. Are you more valuable to a band if you can do these four things? Yes, you are. So this has nothing to do with equipment. This has nothing to do with business. This is making yourself you, as a musician, a valuable entity that the next person can hire and pay. Oh, you play by ear. Can you read music? Uh, read tab. All right, so if you can get to this, tab is guitar, uh, uh, sheet music. You get to this, you're really valuable. How about read uh, the national numbering system? They call it national it's just because that's where it started. That's, you know, somebody says, we're going to play one, four, five. You know, can you C, C, F, G? Can you G, G, C, D? 
You know, you, you, you just know that. And um, every session player in any town knows this system to understand the national numbering system. And if you know this and you're a musician, you can become a session player anywhere because very few people get to this, this point. Play lead, write lyrics, write music. Obviously, probably you write lyrics, maybe write a little music, you create some beats when you're writing music, correct? Anybody do that? Obviously. Right. That's, that's, what, that's what we do now, play scales. So this is just from the performance side. So if you do nothing, if you listen to nothing I say today, except this, say, when I'm done with my career, when I'm, that old guy that's standing up front talking today, if I can do, when I'm his age, which I'm 29, um, again, that's a joke. I'll just tell you when I tell jokes, then you can laugh and we, we won't struggle the whole time, okay? Um, so when you are at the end of your career, you're looking back and saying, yeah, I have maximized my ability to learn and create, and I have added value, every bit of value I can. All right? Think about this. You know, you say, oh, God, I can't afford an instrument. You can go down to the store and buy harmonica today for under $20. You, you can get all kinds of little things. You can write, you can create, you can learn how to read music by just going on the internet. You can learn how to play by ear. There's all kinds of tools. So my challenge to you is get to this point. I wish I could say I was really good at all this. There's a few of these things I'm pretty good at. I don't read very well. I can read, but not very well. I do this well. I, don't, I play lead on the piano really well, but not on guitar. I can write lyrics and music. I play my scales every single day. But the other thing, too, it fulfills you when you know you're constantly learning and, and making your craft better. Even if you never make it, you're still doing this. There's a day goes by, I don't play for an hour every single day. It's my sanity. It's my drug of choice. So I challenge you to do that. Now, let's go to the other side. From a business perspective, teach. Do you know something that somebody else is willing to pay you for? Here's what I'd like to see somebody do. I'd like to see somebody teach rap. I mean, I go to Hyde Music and I go to these music stores, there's people teaching rock guitar and classical piano and how to play the flute and the clarinet. I, I mean, I would go to them and say, listen, I teach rap. I mean, I think people would, I mean, it's the number one genre in the world right now. And I don't know if there's, I don't know one, there may be rap teachers, all right? Rob D's right there. But start putting sessions together. Teach what you know. There's always somebody that can learn from you, okay? Technology, learn the technology. I'm jamming too much, so I gotta, I gotta speed up a little here. We got a lot more to cover. cover. What time do we have, by the way? 1.45. 1.45, oh, God, all right, so these are the things, uh, for just from a business side of it, I talked about just a second ago. So you know, just start stretching and learning these things. One other challenge to you, who's the, think in your head of the, the artist you cannot stand. You don't like this artist or this genre in this artist. All right, you don't have to say it out loud. You know, I don't like fights in here. But... Um, now, my challenge to you is go listen to their music for a week and stretch outside and, and open, your, open your mind a little. Say, okay, I'm gonna write a classical piece of music or I'm gonna write something that just stretches me because when you come back to your genre, you now have a different tool set. It's better, especially if you're gonna adopt something you really don't like, okay? So you are a business and you gotta think about it this way. Um, you are a development firm, you make product, you market your business, you figure out some image and look and communication to the world, you sell it to the world, and then you've got to think about your finance. One of the challenges uh, that I have for you today is how much money did you make last month? To the penny. You're gonna, from here on out, I want you to know that. How much did you make and how much did you spend? This is your business. I can tell you exactly, I won't tell you, but I can tell you exactly what the, the month closed yesterday on Broad Jam, and the first thing I did this morning is look and see how much money we made and what we spent. If I don't do that, I have employees that I have to let go if I'm not making more than I spent. And you start thinking like that. This is what you have to do. 
to run, because you don't want somebody else handling your money. <laughs> you want to do, now someday, we hope we have a, a team of people handling our money. That's the goal. But the point is, these are the four things you have to think about running your business. Not in detail. I still want you to put most of your work in creative. You need to know a little about these things. And we're going to talk about just some of the basics. Your product development. Understand your music is a product to everyone else. It's a product. To you, it's, you know, we're spilling our guts. We're writing what we love. But to everyone else, it's just it's a song. Now, maybe the people close to you can feel it and they feel the emotional load, but it's a song. So just keep understand that. Uh, products are not late or early, they're good or bad. Uh, so uh, there's a song out there you probably really like. Maybe the Travis Scott piece, he's number one, by the way, this week. Uh, maybe you don't like it. Can you tell me, what is it, was it late or early coming to the market? We don't know any of that. But so often as independent musicians, we, we oh, I gotta get this done, I gotta get this done, I gotta get this done. Now you get it right. The number of CD release parties I've been to where the CDs weren't there because they announced the date ahead of time and they were pushing the product right up to the end and they couldn't get the duplication done in time. And so you get everything done, then you market. So products are, and you have to, oh, you only have to be right one time. I'd rather see you take, instead of having just 50 pieces of music in the can or 100 in the can, take the best of all those and get three or four really good pieces of music. That's, that's the key. Anybody that is successful will tell you, they never quit exploring the stuff that they did a long time, and they'll grab a little piece of it. Every song has some magic in it. Every piece of music you create has some magic. And you only have to be right with one of them. And so just keep that in mind, all right? Know your market. I talked about that a second ago with film and TV. The same happens with radio. Same happens with every, every uh, for uh, labels and agencies and touring, certain places you go. You know, if you're in a classical, classical orchestra, you're probably not gonna play the High Noon Saloon here, you know? So you know the market. You know where to try to pitch your music. It's, keep that in mind. All right, and keep every idea you come across. You probably do this. You get an idea, you record it. Keep every single idea and file them away. You never know when you're going to need them again. And we all have done that. You go, oh man, there's that thing I did a couple years ago. Let me go grab that because it works perfectly with what I'm doing now. So often we, you know, so many people just, ah, I'll just get, I'll come back. No, you can't remember it. The faintest line is better than the best memory. All right. So here's. Run your business on an aglet. And I know some, so some of you have probably said, God, you know, I'm not a business. You know, but you are. You are a business. If you want to be make it, you're, you are a business. You have heard of the, run your business on a shoestring? Well, the aglet is that little plastic tip at the end of the shoestring. So you only spend money on what you need to spend money on. That next piece of gear doesn't create better songs. Just creating songs does. Creating beats in, in, in your heart, in your mind, in, in allowing yourself to just take it all in and, and put better music out. Certainly, we want to have better gear as we grow, but only buy what you need to buy and spend money on what you need to spend money on. Create a forecast and a budget. Anybody do that? How much am I going to spend next month? How much am I going to make next month? Very important that you do this so you understand where you are. Otherwise, we struggle. Examine your expenses. Uh, sign every check. I still do that to this day in my company. Where the check goes out the door, I don't sign. And, and you know, obviously, when I was a young musician, I was by myself. I didn't have a team or another person to do that. Uh, and I understand that. You probably aren't in that position. But always keep an eye on what you're spending. Negotiate every deal for yourself. Know the deal terms ahead of time and read that book, Music, Money, and Success. I should talk to those guys and see if I can get a little commission on this every time. <laughs> um, I, this is, uh, it, that book has really, really helped frame my thinking about things. So let's talk about sales a little. I got this email not too long ago from somebody. Invite me to a show. Of 
question you, did I go to the show or not? No. I mean, the, 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 the person says, ah, oh, my stuff is crap, but I'd like you to come out and check it out. That's basically what he's saying. And he says, oh, by the way, if you're interested in my stuff, I'm on all of your competitors. I'm at SoundCloud, Reverb Nation, and CD Baby. So, uh, and, and it's funny, I, I sit on panels and various uh, uh, events and, and talk to the guys that run these other, and they get the same thing. They get an email, hey, would you check out my stuff? And it's, I mean, you don't go into Kohl's and say, hey, you know, Walmart's got this great shirt down there. Can you guys go over there and get this for me? Think about the, your business. Make it really easy for the person on the other end to do business with you. And for me, it's I go to my website and are you here? I'm not trying to sell my website to you. That's not the point. But think about it. If you're on SoundCloud, head of Reverb Nation is not going to SoundCloud to check you out. It's not going to happen. So think about when you send these things out, what you're saying. And I get one of these every single day. Every day of my life I get one of these. And I just can't, I, I, I just say, hey, you know, I'm not going to be able to make it. Best of luck to you. You got to put as much time in this, not as much time, but this is your, your image, what's happening. Okay? So, um, here's the second thing if you're going to walk away. Let's say you finish a song today, right now. You get a production done right now. Who are you going to pitch that to? Who's the first person you take it to? Hmm, I'm not really sure. That's called your top 40. I, I have this little thing I call the top 40. I tell me a new idea, a new product, or a new artist. Uh, that I want some, I have my top 40, my top 35 that I'm going to get it to right away. And that's what you need to start creating right now. This is, you see, what we, we're, we, we lose our, our, our sense sometimes when we're, we're moving along in this process that, you know, I just want to make it. I want, and we're trying to appeal to fans. Keep in mind, you really need to sell your, your music to one person. And that's somebody at a label, or somebody at a publishing company, or some agent, or some manager. One person to get behind you. So start building that list of the people you know. It may be people in this room. It may be people not in this room, but people you know, when you get that next song done, you're going to send this to 30 people and get, that you know will give you honest feedback and can help you do something in the business. So create that top 40 list. And maybe you have, I call it, it could be top 10, it could be top 20, whatever. I call it top 40 because of the music industry. All right? And talk to one person every day. Think about it. Just one person. I say customer. Somebody who might buy your music. And I know this is a little strange because, you know, I don't look at people who buy my music as a customer. Oh, well, call it a fan. Put a fan in there. Or somebody that you want to get your music. Possibly somebody. And just figure that out. Just think, if you did this every single day, you need one different person a day for a year, and you're, you're, you're now pushing your music to different people. Uh, now, the other thing that we make a mistake, this happens a lot, email, text, social media, or phone. Every person, you should know how they respond. Some people respond to email, some people respond to text. You have friends that you've texted and they never respond. Well, maybe they don't text. And if it's people in the industry, you're trying to make it easy for them to do business with you. So make a little note of what, how do they respond. You know, and if they don't respond to text, send them an email. And if they don't respond to emails, call them. Or post on social media. Send them a message via social media. Find out how they respond, and that's, and that's how you communicate with them. In my case, I get over 200 emails, texts, or social media, or phone inquiries every day of my life. And I just can't do it. Um, I, so I try to go through the email. That's where I spend most of my time. Um, so, but everybody's different. So and when I say, I'm just gather a little data so you understand when you're putting your stuff out there, how people are going to respond to you. Um, let's skip over this one. Here's a question. How do you make 40000 a year in your market? All right. So you're going to go play live. You go to a gig, how much are you going to make at your gig? Anybody? If you're playing in a band. 
$200, How many of those can you do a year? So what we're getting at here is, is pretty simple. I want you to think about how much money am I going to make in the next year? What, how much, uh, how much are, uh, do I want? Well, we all want to make and we put a million there, but that doesn't mean we're going to do it. But what's reasonable? Maybe it's 10000 How can I make 10000 in the next year? And you start breaking it down. Here's some ideas for you. And this comes from various people that I've talked to around the country. So if you're in a band, you're probably going to make 250 bucks, maybe minimum. Do one gig a month, or one, one a week, 50 gigs a year, $12,000. Uh, so you do house concerts, tip jars. Uh, and by the way, here's a... Here's a uh, here, here's, if you put a tip jar in the front of the stage, if you're performing, you will get 30% less tips than if it's at the side of the stage. Why is that? People in the audience do not want to be on stage. They do not want to walk up to the front of the stage and put money in because they don't want to be seen. That's why they're audience members. So put a sign on the front of your stage that says tip jar with an arrow to the right, and then put the tip jar over to the side so they can walk along the side and put the money in. That's, it's been tested and true so, for so long. If you put the tip jar in the center of the stage, you'll get very few dollars put into it. Put it on the side and remind them to tip you too, because some people may not even see that. All right? So all of these different things, kids clubs will pay 50 bucks to come in and talk to the kids. This is a lot of work. I'm not, I'm not suggesting this is easy to do, but you can get there. Okay? You just got to think about, this is where I'm going to get, right? All right. So we talked a little now about, um, you know, your, your business, about you, how do you make yourself more valuable, um, how you can make some more money, but how do you stay sane during all this? I, I, I've been in the music business since 19, well, I have never not been in the music business in my life. I've been, since I could walk, um, I've been playing an instrument. I've been thinking about this my whole life. Making money doing it probably since I was 18 or 19. Understanding what the hell I'm doing, that started when I was about 40 probably. Uh, you, I, like, you, for some, I wish I could rewind the clock and, and know then what I know now. So this is how you stay sane. I, it just, this is basic stuff. Give yourself some solitude every day. So often we go through our days and we just, oh, I gotta do this, I gotta do that. Just sit, sit. when you get up in the morning, just spend 15 minutes thinking about what you're gonna do. What are you gonna knock out today? And by the way, the stuff that's hard for you, do that first. Because all the easy stuff we do first and then the other stuff gets pushed till the next day. Just put the hard stuff, the stuff you don't like. Maybe some of the stuff I was talking about, the finance, the marketing, some of that, and spend 15 minutes on it. But just do a little every day to get in the habit of doing it. All right, and then create some art. Make sure that never stops. That's why we're all here. All right, listen to some music, something in and out of your wheelhouse. Every time you stretch outside of your uh, genre, you are getting better. Damn, I'm not gonna listen to that jazz crap. Those guys play a whole bunch of wrong chords and they call it jazz. Oh, man, those guys really know what they're doing. Now, once you start listening to it, and you can't do it, I mean, I, I know, I try. Uh, but listen to something that is just new and unique and different to you that you never think about listening to, and it's going to make you better. Anybody do that now? When I was younger, I, I used to live in Philly, and they had a, they had a CD store there, uh, and they had $2 CDs. And I'd take 20 bucks, and I'd go down, and I'd just give it to the guy behind the counter and say, go pick 10 CDs for me. I don't even want to pick it. Man, I, the X-Men, Art of Noise, some of the great, great... Uh, just 80s acts that I just was turned on to because I, I, I would have never bought it on my own. And I just listened and got better. All right? Read something. Gain some knowledge. It's, it, you'll never, never lose by studying uh, about your career. Put in a little time. Walk. Maybe while you're doing your affirmation, just take a walk. Make sure you stay in shape. Because, you know, we, st we start getting a little... Uh, a little... Uh, uh, out there and our mind starts wandering us. So, so keep yourself healthy. Play a game. Uh, 
man, I'll go to Angry Birds. If I'm just stuck, I go to Angry Birds. There ain't anybody in here that beat me in Angry, Angry Birds. I can tell you that right now. But uh, Now, I'm not saying play Angry Birds for seven hours a day or some game seven hours a day. I'm just saying that let your mind wander and do something totally different so you can get back onto the things you need to be doing. And a lot of times I find myself when I'm playing a game, I'm really thinking through some pro I'm not even really playing the game. I'm just going through the motions. I'm just, I'm just allowing myself to do something else so I can think a little. And introduce yourself to someone. This is something you do every day on Facebook or, or LinkedIn. And I, I, I wish I would have had this opportunity when I was growing up, especially on LinkedIn. I know that isn't the cool site, but it is the business site. And you can really make some connections there. Uh, help someone. And when you're feeling down about where you are, on, just go help somebody else. And it lifts you. It lifts them and it lifts you. And there's nothing wrong with it. OK. So, so just to wrap a few things up here. You have to consent to losing sight of the shore. What does that mean? Let go with your comfort zone. Let go of your comfort zone. You have to, you're going to grow during the tough times. You have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable if you're going to be in the creative world. We never seem settled as creative people. The growth happens when you're down. When you have those tough times, get your pen and paper out and write because that's when you're growing. You know, trees don't grow on top of, on top of mountains. They grow in the valleys. And, and when you're down and you break up with your spouse or your significant other, uh, that's when you write about it. When, when there's challenging financial times, you write and write and pour it out because that's when you're going to have, you're the most vulnerable, that's when the best songs are coming. All right? And remember, tough times are, there's always going to be tough times. They just be tougher than the times. And you'll get through it. So, Experience is not relevant. Like I said, the captain of the Titanic sailed for 26 years. It doesn't matter how long you're doing. How many careers have you seen just sailing along and then they just disappear? You think, how did this person just drop off the face of the earth? Because experience is not relevant in the music business. Now, it might help you get a gig or two, or you know, you play a club, you do well, you come back, the club owner will hire you again, or you, you, uh, you're working with a band, they like you, you can do a second trip around. Certainly, that kind of experience is. But always keep pursuing something new. And there's never a time when an opinion of you should dictate your own direction. The good and the bad of social media. Social media can destroy it if you listen to what people are saying. Especially the 1% the who are just the naysayers and the haters. Get them out of your life. Block them. I don't care how close you are to them. I have a family member. I just, I, I can't even read what they write anymore. And uh, there's never a time when the net worth of another is how you determine your own self-worth. So I, I just want enough, I just want money. I did blah, blah, blah. That, that is not going to make you feel better about anything. Certainly it might pay the bills, so you feel a little better about that. But um, uh, yeah, just, just keep your own direction defined. All right, leaders study their peers, and so do followers. So if you want to be a musician, you find out who you like and you read about them, you study them, and you understand what made them tick. How do they get their deals? And understand when those deals come along that you know what a good deal and a, a bad deal is. And you're the leader of your own career. So often we, we say, oh, you know, God, that guy really screwed up. All that excuse list that I showed you early on. And so often we go there. Well, you know, that so-and-so screwed me, blah, blah, blah. You know, no, you are, you are it. You're responsible for your own success. And when you succeed, be humble. And when you fail, you take responsibility. It's really important, really important. Because people in the industry, you know, in any industry, it doesn't matter where you are, they want to deal with people who are easy to deal with. Now, we see uh, people who've made it that just seem like they're arrogant and out of control. There's very few of those. And they certainly didn't climb the ladder like that. They may have gotten there afterwards, but climbing the ladder, you don't make it like that. So let's just review. And then I think I got a minute for a few questions, if I'm not mistaken. Whoops, there. Right. Be prepared with the right materials. Obviously, I said that twice, so you're prepared. Not because I made a mistake and put it on the list twice. That's humor. Uh, I guess it's deep thought humor. <laughs> uh, know what to say, uh, what not to say about your product. Know uh, when you're pitching, the cognitive versus creative. Uh, again, like I said, one thing, make yourself more valuable. Make somebody want to hire you. 
And that list, that creative list that I showed you on them, man, you do all that, and you're not going to have to worry about gigging as a musician ever. Understand that your business, uh, your products are good or bad, not late or early. You know the iPhone was three years late? Uh, there was a product years ago when I was in the technology business called the ADAT. Uh, and uh, it was over two years late in a completely shut down music stores because they announced it and didn't deliver it for two years. It was so revolutionary, no one was buying recording uh, 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 devices. The tape stopped, tape sales stopped. 40% of the tape sales stopped. And it shut down music stores because of that announcement. And it was two years late. Uh, so products are not late or early. They're good or bad. Maintain a top 40. Run your business on an egg um, uh, Understand the 40K, and the, the daily rituals. Like I said, lose sight of the shore. Let go, constantly seeking out the new stuff and get comfortable. Um, because we're, you know what, it doesn't matter how far, how much we make, we're always uncomfortable as creative people. We are constantly uncomfortable. We're always trying to do the next best thing. And I guarantee you, you can ask anybody that's presented today what they're thinking about, they're thinking about their next thing. They're not thinking about what they did. Experience is not relevant, and your opinion of yourself is the only one that matters. Now, I don't want you to take this too far, okay? Yeah, I'm the baddest ass in the world, you know. You have to have that confidence but you're humble when you present it, okay? And study your peers, take the responsibility, but also the, the last thing here, and then we'll open up for some questions. Remember why you do this for a living. Why do you do this? For me, I have to play every day. I don't have to run broad jam every day. I don't have to uh, learn a new piece of technology. I have to create music every day, and I love doing it. And, and you keep that in perspective with all this other crap. Well, I'm not, you know, look it, I've never had a successful song in my life. I don't care, that's not why, I've never done it that way. Uh, I, I do it because I love to do it. And you never know what's coming, but just remember why you do it. Okay, thank you. Any questions or comments or threats at this point? <laughs> Do I want to take me out back and uh, out behind the woodshed and beat the hell out of me? No. What do you think? Ask a question. How many hip hop artists in Madison have been successful? In with Madison? Your, yeah, with your website. Oh, with my website? I couldn't even tell you. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I know there's a lot of hip hop artists in Madison that are on our website. Yeah. Um, whether they're successful, I, I guess we'd have to define it. Did they get a song placed in front yeah, of the TV? Well, yeah. let's put it this way. Let me give you the odds. We have 700,000 songs on our site, people from 190 countries and 190,000 members. Uh, we get two licenses every day. So every year we get about eight or 900 licenses. So the chances are slim and none. And we do quite well, actually. So I, I don't know of anybody that's been successful. I know there's a few guys, there's a writer out of Sun Prairie, uh, uh, Michael Brandmeier, that's had a few successes with us in film and TV, a couple other ones. But I would think if you ask that same question about any city in the country, I would give you the same answer. I'm not going to promise you anything. What I will tell you, though, is the people who have gotten on our site and connected to other artists, all over the world, they're finding much more success than they are through our licensing mechanism. And that's what I encourage you to do. Okay. Payne? I have a question from online. Yeah. It says, uh, from Phoenix Beats, he wants to know, let me find it, let me find it. If, can a producer pitch music that's already being distributed? If they created it, certainly. Uh, is, it, is it, if it's, that's a good question, actually. There's, you, you can cover a piece of music and or you can create your own music and pitch it. Now, if you've already created the music and you're, you've, and it's your music and you're, you can pitch it for the rest of your life. But if it's somebody else's song, then there's two elements here. There's always the publishing side and the label side. The publishing side is the writers and the people who, who make and create the product. The label side are the people who make the recording. So uh, let's just take an old standard like Georgia on my mind. Um, 
that's been recorded, I don't know, probably a thousand times by everybody from Willie Nelson to Aretha Franklin to artists are recording every day. Well, if you're going to license that song, you have to get permission from Pure Music, who owns the publishing on that. And if you want Willie Nelson's version, you've got to get permission from his record label. So to answer that guy's question, uh, if, if you're covering somebody else's music, you can certainly pitch it. But you, you have to get permission from the person who wrote the song uh, before they can license it. Now, if it's a known piece, and it, you know, it, it triggers another thought. I highly encourage you to cover music. And there's a reason. When somebody goes to iTunes and is searching for your music, it's not likely the masses are searching for your music. But if you cover somebody's music, a, a song that somebody else has done, and they go to iTunes and are looking for that song, and they find you because you've covered it, now you have an opportunity. So it's not a bad thing. You know, a lot of times we say, you know, I don't want to do covers. I want to do my own thing. Well, there might be a good marketing and business reason to do covers. And I think club owners, too, will probably tell you, one of the best ones ever, standing right there, will tell you that they like to have bands do a couple covers in every set so the audience can recognize something. So what else? Any other questions? Go ahead. As far as, like, reaching out to new people, meeting new people online, showing them way to like, reach out to somebody to have them check out your content without sounding too pushy. Well, right. here's how you can do it, at least on our side. I can't speak for other sites. I can tell you, on our, we have five different review mechanisms on our site. So you put your music into the review mechanism, and you get your music into the mechanism by reviewing music. So if you review somebody else's music, you like it, you send them a note and say, man, I love your stuff, I'd love to work with you. Hey, can you connect, uh, could you check out some of my stuff? That's the best way. Uh, if you just send it to a whole bunch of people and say, hey, check out my stuff, and we get that every day, uh, likely no one's going to listen to it. But if you can give, you know, shout out to them a little, they'll come back to you. That's, what, that's, how, I, that's how I would approach them. That's what people do that are successful on our site. Um, how do you balance time and energy with ensuring like, the quality of your work with personal deadlines? Ah, man, that's a good question. That's a good question. Uh, I, you know, I went through this list here called the Daily Rituals. I think the most important thing you can do is just allow yourself a little solitude every day to figure out what you're going to get done today. Now, the question is for the, maybe you didn't hear in the back, how do you balance your time and energy? Um, there's a guy, I don't know if any of you have uh, heard Martin Atkins speak. And Martin is this guy out of Chicago. And the first thing he does when he speaks, the first words that will come out of his mouth, and if you go to his website right now, at the top of it, it says, get the fuck out of bed. That's what he says. <laughs> he said, I'll tell you why. He says, I'm still writing music. I get up at 6 o'clock every day, and by 10 o'clock, my business is done, and I write music the rest of the day. So if you don't get up until 10 o'clock, I'm 20, what, 20 hours ahead of you every week. So I, I'm not saying you have to get up, but you have to carve out time in the day for your career and time in the day for the cre to create. And what that is for each individual, I don't know. I mean, for me, I have an hour a day to make music. That's it. That's all I have. I have a family, a son. I, you know, I, I have you know, responsibilities, house payments and car payments and things. But every one of us have to say, okay, I can do this much every day. And, and, but stick to it, whatever you decide for yourself. I hope that answers your question. It's, it's a hard thing, a hard question. And by the way, you will always, you'll be asking yourself that question uh, until you retire. Anybody else? Yes, sir, back there. Um, you were talking about creating crap uh, for customers or fans. But it, at what point, because you made music for yourself to kind of relieve the stress that you have and things that you have, at what point is that a healthy mix to Creating music for a live audience compared to just creating it for like yourself. Because I have songs that I make like, oh, I find this super dope, but someone else might, might not find it dope. How do you help we balance those without like being a sellout, for lack of a better term? Well, that, that's, a, that's a really good question, you know, and I'll, I'll personalize it. I wrote a song after my father died in 1979. I was, I was 19. And if you listen to the song, you'd probably say, that song sucks. That's never going anywhere. And you would be right. It's never gone anywhere. But every time I play it, I can't get through it without a tear in my eye. I could care less if that song goes anywhere. 
uh, sometimes you just have to create music for that reason. And, and look, at if you ask anybody who's made it that's been accused of being a sellout, they're not going to say, yeah, I sold out because I wrote that. Look, at any of us, I, hell, I'd be playing accordion music and, 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 and yodeling if I could have the number one song in the world and have that revenue to allow me to do whatever I wanted to do in the future. Now, sometimes that others can perceive that as selling out, but I look at it like this. I would rather do that than make it, than work in McDonald's and not make it. <laughs> you know, so I, I, lose, I, I would encourage you maybe to lose that thought process. Do what you love to do, but also understand what the market is buying. You know, and if you're writing giant and instrumentals that sound like the Hawaii Five O theme song, you're probably not going to sell much music. But if you're writing hip hop beats with alt rock guitars on them and some, uh, you know, maybe some uh, James Blunt type vocals over the top of them, you've probably got a really good shot right now uh, because that's what's happening. So I don't think that's selling out. I think that's saying there's a market. I'm going to try to, uh, you know, create something within that market. Okay, I've probably gone over my time, haven't You're I? You're about perfect. I, you, we, can sorry. I record that and you can play that for my wife? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's 217, so. 217. Oh, all right. Okay. Any other thoughts or questions that I can uh, uh, exaggerate or elaborate on? That? All right. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Good luck.